Thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, the view graphs for this talk are actually a web page. So if you want to play along with the demos on your iPhone, uh, which demos will come up in about three view graphs, you can just visit the URL on, in the upper left corner. So let's begin at the beginning. A few days after the Challenger accident in early 1986, Steve Murray called me into his office and he said, the ROSAT launch is going to be delayed. I don't know for how long, but it could be years. That means you have some extra time for software development. I want you to use some of that time to figure out how to build really a really good image display program, one that will take advantage of our new Sun workstations. Maybe something good can come out of this horrible tragedy. And that was the birth of the original SAO image, a project I did with Mike Van Hilst leading to SAO TNG with Doug Toady and John Roll, and of course DS9 with Bill Joy. For 30 years, we've been following Steve's lead, trying to make something good come out of the Challenger disaster. And during that time, we've mostly followed the model of desktop data analysis, locally installed software acting on local data in a local environment. But the world is moving beyond local computation. On the one hand, Dropbox and Amazon Web Services and Google Drive and web apps are all pushing data and computing somewhere out there. On the other hand, tablets and smartphones are changing the very notion of a computing device. We may be in a transition as far-reaching as the early 1980s when we went from shared mini-computers to personal workstations. What might that mean for astronomical data analysis? A couple of years ago, Alexei and I decided to investigate this question by building cross-platform web-based image display. The hope was to do something that would be useful in the present while giving us a hint about future possibilities. I think that's a pretty good aim for transition software in a transition period. The key to doing image display on a web page is the HTML canvas element, which supports display of 2D shapes and bitmap graphics. You add a canvas element to the web page using the familiar angle bracket notation, and then you draw your lines and shapes. You can also draw an entire image into the canvas, so you can retrieve, for example, a bunch of TIFF images and display them in turn in response to mouse clicks. But for astronomical image display, we need a lower level of control than draw image. We need get image data and put image data, which allow you to get and set the individual RGB pixel values themselves. This manipulation of RGB values is just the standard true color support in DS9. You take a color map, use contrast and bias to shift and stretch it, redistribute the colors using the scaling algorithm, and then index each data pixel into the resulting color map array to get the RGB value. Write those RGB values into the canvas element and you're done. It's all very straightforward, in theory anyway. In practice, things are not so simple. The big issue on the web is speed, just as it's always been. And contrast bias is a key test of speed, just as it's always been. You want to press the mouse and move it around and see image features come into focus. For true color, this means changing hundreds of thousands of RGB values and redrawing the image as the mouse moves. In the early days of X11 and SAO image, true color manipulation was impractical. The CPUs were simply too slow. Instead, we use pseudocolor, where you change the color cells in a private color map and let the hardware do the rest. It was fast, but it had some serious drawbacks. Some of you will recall the bane of color flash, where the screen colors changed hideously as you move from one application to another. In the early days of DS9, graphics cards stopped supporting true color, and we had to, I'm sorry, pseudocolor, and we had to go with true color. The CPUs were barely fast enough to do this, even using optimized C++ code. So DS9 had an option to limit the size of the redisplayed rectangle while the mouse was moving, the full image being updated only after the mouse was released. How fast would JavaScript be? It took me a few months to find out. By July 2013, the proof of concept looked exactly like this. Just a canvas element, no menu, no options, no nothing. And one day, with a little trepidation, I pressed the mouse and I did this. Okay. 
I don't know if Alexa heard the shout of surprise when I first saw this work, but I reproduce here the entire contents of Steve Murray's email shout when he loaded the demo page from Baltimore. And wow, with four exclamation points, is exactly what I thought, because this was our first indication that Google and Apple and Mozilla were taking browser performance really, really seriously. It turns out they were just starting to use the computer's GPU <coughs> excuse me, to improve performance radically. It was pretty amazing to watch Firefox do contrast and bias faster and more reliably with each update. So once we succeeded with the contrast and bias experiment, we can implement a lot of image display features that we're used to, zooming and scaling and color maps and regions and WCS and remote analysis. So you can change the color map, and I'm going to see if we can get, whoops, see if we can get something a little that shows a little bit better. And you can do things like create a region, move it around, resize it a little bit, and then ask a back-end server to, to uh, extract a spectrum and display it in JS9. All of this stuff is kind of standard for, for DS9, but it's really very nice to see it working in a web browser. It's worth noting that implementing these features was aided by a lot of high-quality JavaScript support software. The web community is large and active, and lots of people are working on problems similar to us. So we can get the line graphics uh, for regions from fabric.js and plotting capabilities from Flot and these really nice lightweight windows these guys, from Dynamic Drive, and that leaves us room to concentrate on problems more closely related to astrophysics. So it took me a while to realize that JS9 isn't a standalone X program, but it's part of a web page. The first point to appreciate is that a web page is a complete environment with JavaScript as the unifying glue. The second point is that the available screen display is limited, as you've already seen, much more so than on the desktop. And the third point is that web, web page designers expect to have complete control over the whole environment. This leads to a new dimension of design requirements beyond the desktop. For example, the fact that screen real estate is limited means you can't create one user interface and expect to meet everyone's needs. Web designers will want to choose different aspects of JS9 functionality for their application. So someone might want to show the JS9 panner in a random place on a web page, like here, but not the magnifier. So you just have a panner, but no magnifier. But you, you still might want to give users access to the magnifier. And that means you have to allow for static placement, like this guy, on the page, as well as dynamic display, something like this. And there are other parts of the JS9 display that you might want, want to see, but see them dynamically. For example, oh, I don't know, the info box, a nicer info box than, than the default. In fact, this sort of flexibility has to extend down to fine-grained control over all of JS9's functions. You might want to eliminate the menu entirely and provide buttons for a, only a select number of functions, like this. So turn off the menu, and these are the functions that we have left. So we can change the color map. We can make us well, here, it would look better if I delete this. Make a circle and run the same energy plot that we had run before. All of these options have to work together seamlessly. The upshot is that JS9 has to pay very careful attention to the design and implementation of public programming interfaces in order to provide an environment in which you have pretty good control over the whole image display. <laughs> so one day it dawned on to me that 
dawned on me that JavaScript's access to the whole web page environment includes access to the underlying image data. And that means that application programmers can build their own analysis tools right into a JS9 web page. All of this analysis, which was written by John Roll, is being performed in the browser itself using the public programming interface and the plugin interface. Each of these particular analysis plugins have registered a callback on the region change event, so they get called every time a region is moved or resized. Of course, plugins don't have to be defined statically on the web page, they can be displayed dynamically. Bring up the pixel table. The plugin pixel table registers its callback on mouse move events and therefore updates continually as you move the mouse around. Once you see the power of plugins, you begin to realize that the line between what you do in the browser and what you do on a back-end server is completely unclear. And as we'll see, this question is taking on more and more importance because of how the web is evolving. The result of all our efforts was the pr first public release of JS9 on October 1st of last year. I thought it was pretty good. It supported a lot of familiar features while offering some new web-based ideas and capabilities. But less than a week after its release, we got an email from a group in the Czech Republic <coughs> complaining that they couldn't open their tiled compressed fits images in JS9. I'd never heard of tiled compressed images. They turn out to be a fits.io convention. <coughs> Not a fit standard, but that's not much of an excuse. Apparently, they are widely used in the, astronom in the astronomical community, supported by a, the de facto fit standard library, and thus have to be part of any serious application. When I went to talk to Bill Joy about tile compressed images, he just put his head in his hands because supporting them in DS9 is painfully complicated. And then I put my head in my hands because I realized that I was going to have to duplicate a lot of CFITS.io functionality in JavaScript. But amazingly, it turns out this problem was basically solved by work being done in the web community. In this case, Mozilla has a project called mscripten that allows you to compile C code to specially optimize JavaScript. We had already used mscripten to convert a few of Jessica Mink's WCS routines to support JS9's WCS display. But now I compiled all of CFITS.io to JavaScript, added a thin wrapper, and loaded the two megabyte JavaScript file into JS9. And here's the result. That's a, that's a rice compressed image, which CFITS.io is simply reading and displaying uh, as, as it always does. And thanks to Mozilla's work on mscripten, we have full CFITS.io functionality in, in JS9 at the cost of writing about 500 lines of wrapper code. The mscripten developers are currently working on dynamic loading, threading, memory management, and other extensions. And beyond that, a consortium of development groups is working on a web binary format that will speed up compilation, provide better optimization, and allow for the addition of features needed to approach native performance. All of these efforts promise to have a large impact on the line between the browser and the server. I think this is a crucial area of exploration for our future needs. Last month, Joe DePasquale and I started talking about adding advanced image processing functionality such as composite blending to JS9. You may have heard his talk on this topic last summer. As it turns out, the Web Consortium has released a new recommendation to add various Photoshop-like blending modes to HTML5. It's already implemented in Firefox, Chrome, and Safari. So once again, our needs are aligned with work being done in a much wider community. Now, I've still got time, right? Okay. So since I have some time, I'll show you a few other aspects of JS9 in demo. And once again, you can play along at that web page. So here's a web page with two image displays. 
Of course, they have to work independently so that you can operate on each of them individually. But you also might want to have them coordinated. For example, you might want to run back-end analysis to display spectral plots in a common window like this. The window is here, by the way. Or you might want to control both displays simultaneously using a super menu like this. But of course, you have to go, be able to go back to independence as you want. Once again, it's, a public, it's the public programming interface that allows all of this to happen. Now, since the invention of XPA messaging in the 1990s, We've gotten used to controlling image display from external programs. I hope you're going to be able to see this. The JavaScript, the JS9 script will control one or the other display based on the display's ID. So if the left-hand display is called foo, we can change the color map this way. Or change the right-hand one if we decide. That's foo2. A little bit hard to see. Let's, let's get it back to something decent. Oop, now my typing's gone right down the tubes. There's also a Python interface to JS9. Again, you connect to one or the other displays uh, via the ID. And then you can, you can ask for uh, the current color map or set the color current, current color map, etc. Actually, there are two APIs for Python. One of them is a short and formal one for typing commands like you've seen. The more, the more formal one doesn't return strings. Whoops. but returns Python objects that you can then operate on in the Python programming language. Well, there's a lot more to show, but I suspect we're starting to run out of time. So demos are fun, but how can we use JS9 today? It's already being used in a number of different areas, including lab work, front-end to data archives, telescope control, and hopefully soon education. A lot of these activities are web-based already, so using JS9 is a fairly obvious thing to do. But astronomical data analysis is, is another matter. We're still pretty firmly tied to the desktop. Will that be the case in the foreseeable future? Perhaps. But as our technological world becomes more and more dominated by cloud-based apps, we may start thinking new thoughts about how to do data analysis. If your photos are accessible everywhere, why not your data? If you can edit your documents from anywhere, why not data analysis from anywhere? What sort of things can we imagine doing now, and what might the data center of the future look like? I can only see a little way down the road, so I don't really know where all of this is going. But I've seen enough to know that there is a whole web world out there to explore beyond the desktop. And in this world, really smart people are thinking hard about the future. I believe we would do well to join their efforts. Thank you. Well, we have time for questions. Yes. Uh, how hard would it be to get data that isn't in bits format in, or can it already do that? Uh, like what kind of data? Uh, let's say HDF5. I think what you need is um, there is a, there is, support in JS9 for converting to a special type of encoded PNG file that we invented for x-ray data. And so what you really would need to do, I think, is run some kind of conversion program, which we do on the fly. I can show you demos here. Uh, 
that if you do that, then you download the, this representation PNG and everything works uh, as you would expect it after that. I mean, in my, in, in my view, once you're converting, I would go to something that the browsers actually know how to deal with really quickly. And that's one of the reasons that we, we started thinking about how do you convert FITS to PNG file, because they can, they, can, uh, they can load those things, uncompress them, and load them really much faster than we can do by hand. So there's plenty of possibilities. Well, the, the creation of PNG file happens on the server side, okay. and so based on how the site is set up, it would actually uh, it would actually know what to do. In the case of HDF, we would actually have to add some stuff. Obviously, I've never given any thought to okay. HDF. Yeah, basically. I mean, that's how you would do all all big extractions, right? Eventually, you want to get to some image that you can view, and it doesn't really matter what's on the back end as long as you can extract it. Uh, create some kind of format that's either fits or or this nice PNG representation and download it. You didn't show any multicolor images like we used to, which represent gradations in, into a spectrum. Is that just because you didn't get around to it, or it lacks that capability? Uh, you know, the false color images that most of them are representing either intensity. Or I hope all of these are. I mean, that's what that is. You can, yeah. Sure, I don't like SLS, but <laughs> in fact, I hate us. Okay, uh, I have to admit, as part of the web page, it didn't quite come out the way I thought it was going to. So, there you have it. Sure, I mean, we... You, you're asking a, a, a request for Bill, right? Right now? <laughs> right. So he's heard it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. I mean, if we if we go to the JS9 website, you'll be in a local browser, and you'll be looking at FITS data that that is sitting on that site. So there really are t there are two modes here, and it actually only the distinction between the modes is less than you would actually think. Uh, basically, you're going to make a URL request, or you're going to make a URL request, and the back end will service that request. So in the case of a data center. Again, uh, given some user interface, which I don't know what it looks like, you simply have to extract the bit that you want to display. And if it's not too large, you can download it as fits. If it's larger, you'll probably want to do something to it to make it a more manageable file. It gets downloaded and displayed uh, just as we've been seeing. Well, I think I, I think um, I think that's up to the site designer. Site designer, if they decide that they want to do extractions based on 
on uh, what it is you've clicked on, you can do extractions. So you can take pieces of things or you can download the entire things, but that's something that happens on the back end depending on what uh, the site developer would do. JS9 can handle either of those. trying to play along on my iPhone. Um, and the problem is, you know, it's an iPhone. Um, but the other problem is, so I hit file, and of course, being an iPhone, it jumps to my pictures. Is there a way to, that will be able to configure where to send um, JS9 to look for data? Because I have data via Dropbox available to me, but I can't. Yeah, that's, I mean, this is precisely the kind of stuff that I'm talking about that we have to start thinking about. I mean, I was just astounded when I brought it up on the iPhone and it worked at all. <laughs> and, it, and it really does work. I mean, it's, it's remarkable. But what we actually do with that, I think, is what we need to put some thought into now. I don't see any reason why, uh, why you can't have your data accessible everywhere and be looking at it on your iPhone. So let me rephrase the question just a little bit. A lot of Java sites or a lot of Java, yeah, Java built sites convert into apps for the various tablets. Have you looked into that as a possibility of sort of rebranding this as various apps um, that are specific for the hardware? Yeah, I mean, you could think about doing that. That means you have to write something for each operating system, right? That wouldn't be my first choice if, if we could get where we wanted to go without it. But one could do that. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Okay. Astronomy at Berkeley. Before she uh, became a professor at Berkeley, she obtained her PhD at MIT, where she actually, and so she's very familiar with the area. And before she joined Berkeley, she was an associate professor at the University of Pennsylvania. Many of you may know her best from her theoretical contribution uh, on extragalactic astronomy and cosmology, but Today, she will tell us about observations uh, on galaxies. Okay, thank you, Akash, and thanks for uh, arranging the talk for me. Um, in fact, I, um, this massive survey that I'll be speaking about, um, I started thinking about that when I was uh, on sabbatical here two years ago. So uh, this really was where uh, things took off. So just very quickly, uh, I want to just highlight okay, my uh, collaborators here. Um, uh, it's a fairly small group of people, and this is a survey to study the most massive galaxies in the nearby universe. But we have since uh, expanded into different uh, subcategories, and I would like to highlight the contribution uh, in the X-ray uh, archival search um, uh, and analysis by Andy Goulding and and and, and, and Akush. <laughs> Uh, and our survey paper was published last year, and the stellar population gradient paper um, led by Jenny Green was published this year, and uh, a molecular gas paper is in press, and we have a number of black hole mass papers and so on uh, coming up. And during tomorrow's lunch talk, I will highlight one, uh, a recent measurement of a very massive black hole there. So today my uh, focus will be more on just the survey itself. Okay, so what is the massive survey? It's, it's a basically an integral field spectrograph survey of the about 100 most massive galaxies by stellar mass uh, within the volume of 108 megaparsec. This volume was chosen to include the coma cluster, which is uh, at about 102 megaparsecs. Uh, we, I wanted to, be, uh, to have a very simple, well-defined selection, uh, selection criterion, so um, really volume limited and selected based on stellar mass is basically the cleanest way you can go about it. And the stellar mass here is based on the K-band magnitude from the two-mass survey. This is a K-band 
magnitudes are good proxies for stellar masses. So of course, from our actual dynamical measurements, we'll be able to improve on the stellar masses of these galaxies. But it's not just a spectroscopic survey. It's also multi-wavelength and photometric survey, as I'll describe momentarily. And the science goals really are to, to do whatever we can to understand these most most massive galaxies, in particular the interior structures. So we're not just getting one point for each galaxy, you know, one sigma, one luminosity or something. We actually want the spatial profiles and the kinematics. And we would like to understand their formation history, and in particular the central black holes that may be lurking. And again, uh, quickly about our sample selection, since this is a survey, uh, it's chosen to have uh, uh, to be very luminous in the K band, minus 25.3 or brighter. The corresponding stellar mass is about 10 to the 11.5 or above, so significantly more massive than the Milky Way, and most of these are early type galaxies. And I just want to highlight a comparison, a contrast that our selection with that of the Alice Sauron Alice 3D um, survey, which is the most comprehensive uh, survey of local early type galaxies um, uh, until our work. Um, and their survey included 260 galaxies, but they're volume limited to 42 megaparsecs. So in the smaller volume, most of their galaxies are in the Virgo cluster. Um, in comparison, our volume reached out um, to the Coma cluster, but we include only the brightest ones. And obviously you can ask, uh, I'll show later, if you want to study very massive galaxies, uh, you can't. You need to include the larger volume because ga massive galaxies are rare. So you, you need a volume to in order to reach uh, that mass. Okay. So in our uh, sample, there are 116 early type galaxies. We didn't want to distinguish E versus Z as zero to do this kind of decomposition. So we included everybody. So uh, no spiral galaxies, though. No no late type galaxies. And this is a northern sky survey. Um, so why, the, the scientific sort of motivations, why do we want to study massive galaxies? And this is just a, a few of the reasons, uh, by no means um, complete, because they are potential sites of the most massive black holes. We know that ma more massive black holes tended to live in bigger galaxies. And so having this sample of well-selected galaxies that provide us uh, with a very good selection to start with to pick uh, candidates for which we can measure black hole masses. Uh, this is what primor prim primordial, uh, <laughs> primarily why I wanted to uh, start this survey, because we have been doing black hole mass measurements for a while, sort of pretty randomly in terms of the target selection. Now we actually have a well-defined sample to choose the galaxies. And also, um, I, I won't have time to touch on this today, but uh, if they're in binaries, and at some point they, they were because we know galaxies merge, black holes merge to form bigger ones. Uh, these are the, especially the, ten, uh, the billion to 10 billion solar mass black holes in binaries. They are sources of gravity waves, not for LIGO, but for the pulsar timing arrays in the nanohertz frequencies. And I think that's a very exciting new area. And uh, the sources I'll be talking about will be the ideal sources for them if they host a binary black holes. I'll be happy to talk to anybody about this in more detail. And also these galaxies, again, they're local, quiescent, dormant. They look boring, okay, and, and not much star formation going on, but they are probably the local counterparts of the most luminous quasars, some of them, at high redshift, and also some of the probably redshift two massive uh, star forming or red nuggets uh, that, um, for example, Sarah Wellens et al. have been studying using the illustrious simulations. So uh, the massive galaxies could be some of these could have evolved into uh, local massive galaxies. Uh, so understanding the ancestral lineage, lineage between these um, populations would be very interesting. And also this AGM feedback, which is worrying everybody who, who does anything basically on the massive end. Um, this is where um, the action once was. And just to highlight that last point, I want to, again, show the illustrious simulation. This is their stellar mass functions at various redshifts. Uh, you can ask many people here about the details, but I just want to highlight that the, this curve, these curves are the simulation results. These symbols are various data points that at a very high mass end, again, our survey target galaxies on the right side of this. You can see both the simulations over predict the number densities of these galaxies. <laughs> 
and also the observations are all over the place. Uh, this, this end is quite difficult to get, and partly because uh, the subgrid physics for AGN feedback is, is quite uncertain, and I know that they are trying to uh, improve on the subgrid physics in their next generation of simulations. But this is also a motivation for why we want to study this regime. Okay, and you can ask, why do we want another survey? Haven't there been enough surveys? You hear about the Sloan Digital Coast Sky Survey, this survey, that survey. Okay, um, and, and plus, these are some of the most famous galaxies. They're all NGC something something. So you can go to Wiki Sky, you can actually have a pretty picture of it. Okay, but it was sort of, that was my first impression. Why don't we, you know, why do we actually need a survey? It was only until when I realized, wait a minute, I don't have the information I needed to select the black holes. When I look into the, the case, then uh, you realize that among the 116 that we carefully selected, actually only 65% of them are in the Sloan footprint. Sloan is not a whole sky survey. Okay, so only about two thirds have a Sloan photometry, let alone the Sloan spectroscopy, okay, they only put spectra on a subset of their galaxies. And so only about 20% of our galaxies have Sloan spectroscopy. In addition, I want to emphasize Sloan spectroscopy uh, is done with a single fiber of three arc second in width. So every galaxy you get one number um, measure within this aperture. I'm going to show you an IFU survey, which uh, our field of view is about two arc minute by two arc minute. Okay, so this is, will be the one uh, of 250 fibers in our observations, this will be the very central one. So we get a very large spatial, spatial extent of each galaxy. And again, about the ALICE 3D survey, the prior early type galaxy survey, uh, because of our larger volume, there's only actually six overlapping ones up, up between our two samples, and these are mostly in Virgo. Okay. And there are only two uh, overlapping with the SLUG survey, which is a larger field of view subsequent survey of uh, uh, 25 galaxy in the ALICE survey. And again, backing up, if you think about most massive galaxies, where should they live? Well, our, our understanding of a, a hierarchical structure formation, you would think massive galaxies live in massive clusters. Sure, you can name a few, okay? Uh, but in fact, not every single one. In fact, many of these don't live in famous clusters, and that, as I'll show you. So you can ask, okay, I. Uh, where are they? Name a few of the most massive galaxies in the nearby universe. Uh, that's a pretty picture of a, of a ball of uh, many, many stars. Okay, it's pretty dead. M87 will be one you probably will come uh, to, to your mind. Okay, and, and that's why at 17 megaparsecs. Okay, another one, this is the brightest cluster galaxy in the Coma cluster. This is at 102 megaparsec now. And this is a much richer cluster, okay? About 10 to the 15th solar masses in virial mass. And, and 4889 is the biggest one there. Still pretty dead, okay? And there's a very interesting black hole at the center, which I won't talk about today. But here's just a subset of the montage of the ones that have SDSS photometry in our massive sample. Okay, I want to emphasize they're mostly dead. Okay, as I'll show you, we actually have, a, we actually detect the molecular gas and ionized gas in some of these galaxies. Okay, um, so again, to emphasize the special distinct parameter space, our survey is sampling. This is just distance to galaxies and their uh, K by magnitude absolute. So this is the corresponding uh, stellar mass. Uh, each point is a galaxy. And here are the ALICE 3D galaxies. Again, they're ma volume limited to 42 megaparsecs. So you can see they have very few massive galaxies. They're rare, okay? And M87 is one of the biggest ones in their sample. Many smaller ones, and they're mostly S0 galaxies. So when you enlarge this volume to 108, then uh, we picked out all these massive ones that were you know, there are more, most of them are more distant than 42 megaparsecs, but they are um, quite, quite massive. Uh, and again, NGC 4889 is still the record holder. Uh, our magnitudes here are based on two mass, and two, two mass is a very shallow all-sky survey. So we do have a deep K-band photometry going on for all of these galaxies to improve on uh, the magnitudes. Some of these probably will move uh, deeper images of M87, for example, have shown more fluff on the outer part, so they can probably only get brighter. Okay, and of course, there are a lot of galaxies there, but they're you know, below our magnitude cut. We are focusing on the massive end. And um, just another slide to show the, in the diverse environment. 
Okay, I've named Virgo, I've named Coma, you probably think of Perseus, Leo clusters. Okay, these are some of the famous northern sky, sky clusters. Um, the information here we have is based on the two mass uh, redshift sky survey, thanks to John Hooker, who had a follow-up of the two mass imaging survey uh, with redshifts. So in fact, there's a catalog by Crooks et al., uh, who ran friends of friends algorithms to link up these galaxies to tell us who is a friend of who, whom. Okay, so here is our um, statistics for the massive galaxies, uh, number of them as a function of the halo mass if they reside in a group according to this two mass group catalog. I just want to highlight that in fact 26 of the 116 are labeled as groupless. They, they don't have friends, meaning they don't have more than three member uh, galaxies in, according to the two mass. Of course, it doesn't really mean they are that isolated. Two mass is shallow, okay? So they ought to have fainter satellites, uh, but they're probably, the satellites probably will be fainter than, than L star galaxies, okay? So they are not Virgo or clusters of coma-like clusters here. So among the 90 that actually have three or more friends, we're plotting the halo mass. Again, this halo mass is taken with a grain of salt. It's based on velocity, velocities of galaxies in the, uh, in the group. So it's a virial mass, and that's a standard way you use uh, optical velocity dispersions to estimate the mass. But I just want to highlight that there is a wide range. These are probably suspect. They have very few members. Uh, but the f highlight that you can ask, is our galaxy the brightest galaxy in that group? And when you look at the lower mass and yes, everybody is the brightest one in that group. However, when you look at the brighter end or the more massive end uh, in halo mass in our sample, we are starting to pick out galaxies that, are, that have an even brighter uh, friend. But the brighter friend, of course, is also in our survey. That is to say, not every galaxy in our survey is uh, the central galaxy. Okay, at this end, we're picking out some of the satellites. Coma is a great example, 4089 is the brightest one, 4874 is the next brightest one, almost as bright, and they're both in our sample. Okay, so this environment is something worth uh, keeping in mind. <laughs> so very quickly, the instruments we're using to, uh, to conduct the survey, um, the, sort of the spectroscopic part versus the photometric part, we want to really get a wide field kinematics of each galaxy and the uh, Mitchell IFU on the 2.7 meter telescope in McDonald Observatory in Western Texas is about one of the biggest wide field um, uh, IFU we can use and it's a very efficient camera uh, spectrograph. And this just highlight, we're not studying spiral galaxies, this is their publicity slide. But to highlight that in one shot, we have 246 uh, fibers. Each fiber gives us a spectrum. Okay, so we get not, instead of a long slit, we have two-dimensional kinematics immediately uh, in the optical range, and it allows us to reach out to at least two effective radii for many of the galaxies. So the, it's the outskirts that, again, Sloan fiber would correspond to the very central one. Okay, so, the, so it's the spatial information we get. But for the black hole mass uh, measurements, a subset of these are suitable for that sort of measurements. We really need to follow up. So the, each fiber is four arc second, is a very fat fiber. So we zoom into the very center and obtain very high resolution, uh, again, IFU data in order to resolve the sphere of influence of the black hole. There we really need to go to the eight to 10 meter telescopes, uh, either with OSIRIS or with AO on or GMOS um, on Gemini or with natural seeing, but down to about 0.4 arc second. Okay. Uh, tomorrow I'll show some results from that. So it's a combination of wide field and high resolution uh, kinematics. The photometry part, I mentioned the deep K-band imaging, but we also obtained uh, 34 orbits for, from cycle 23 to, uh, for one, to, under, to get the very central light profile of these galaxies. Many of our galaxies actually don't have HST archival data, some do. Okay, so we would like to know about the central, whether the profile is core or cusp. Again, I'll come back to that uh, topic tomorrow because the core, these massive galaxies tended to be, the surface brightness of the stars tend to be very core at the center, perhaps due to black hole uh, core scouring, okay, or some kind of black hole feedback. Tomorrow I'll show a very tight correlation we're finding 
between the black hole and the core size. But also, this also allows us to get the surface brightness fluctuation distance to these galaxies. Right now, many of these, uh, the distance are not even very well measured. Okay. Uh, in the radio, uh, we are following up to, um, to try to detect a molecular gas, just to see how dead they are. Okay. And, and I'll show uh, just two slides uh, from the x-ray results. Okay. Again, the status right now is that um, the, uh, we are complete in the brighter magnitude, the 40 of them. We got all data for all of them, and we're writing a kinematic paper for them. But we have in hand, actually, Mitchell IFU data for 70 of them, and we're performing extensive tests on how to <coughs> extract the V and sigma of the velocity moments. We, we also want the higher moments, uh, the skewness and the cortosis. Are, we have enough signal to noise for that. Okay, and the, for the in, for the black hole measurements, we can probably get at least 15 more measurements here. And, and here are the HST and these other um, galaxies we are, um, these other photometry we are pursuing. Okay, so I just want to flash a few uh, uh, examples of survey results we're obtaining. So this is a, uh, this is NGC 1600, and this is the kind of uh, uh, kinematic data we can get from the Mitchell wide field IFU. Again, I want to emphasize this is a two arg minute by two arg minute, a very large field of view. And each, this is based on the spectra we got for each spectrum, but we bend them to increase the signal to noise. I just want to show you, uh, it, it's rotating very slowly, it's plus minus 20 kilometers per second, okay, for a giant elliptical galaxy that has sigma above 300 kilometers per second, and there's non-negligible at H3, H4, uh, we are also detecting. Okay, so th that kind of data allow us to make plots like these. We can study the angular momentum profiles for each galaxy as a function of radius. Again, I want to emphasize we can really reach out to uh, a, a few effective radii here for each galaxy. And you may think at this mass range, everybody should be not should be non-rotators. We do have a few fast rotators, and since we have a very uh, good sample, we can do some statistics about them. Okay, and we can study stellar population gradients in terms of age, uh, metallicities. They, they decline somewhat towards the outskirts, indicating perhaps minor mergers are important. And also, they are very alpha enhanced and so on. Okay, I don't want to go into details. Just want to highlight uh, Jenny's results here. And uh, CO. So these are red and dead galaxies. And we actually thought, let's try. Uh, and Alice 3D had detected some molecular gas in the lower mass ranges. So we, to up our odds, we used either the existence of dust lanes in the existing, any of our galaxy with archival HST data or 22 micron access. These are typically indications for the existence of CO, molecular gas, coal gas. And out of the 11 targets in our pilot program with RM 30 meters, we actually detected six. Okay, and these are the flux versus the velocity width for the six measurements. We see them in both CO1 to zero and CO2 to one. We're following up on the much larger sample to, just to see. Uh, it's probably gonna be fairly rare, okay, but I just want to emphasize these are not completely dead galaxies. They have molecular gas. And if this molecular gas is very well organized, we don't know right now, this is an integrated measurement right now. We're following up with the uh, Plateau de Bure and Alma. If this gas is very real, uh, well regulating a disk around the central region, this could be a beautiful uh, tracer for black holes. Um, so again, ionized gas is also seen in a subsample of them. Uh, in, we don't have H alpha, that's too red for us, but we have O2. Again, the few galaxies actually show emission lines. And for this audience, you may be interested in the X-ray properties, and this is something uh, Andy and Akash are still working on, but I just want to highlight, uh, in fact, 30 plus of them are in the Chandra archi archive, and here are 10 of them, just showing the, the earlier NGC numbers. Um, so for each one here on the left, this is optical image with x-ray contours. This is four arc minute by four arc minute field of view. Okay, on the right for each pair, uh, the blue shading is the x-ray, and the circle, dotted circle here for each of the galaxy shows the one effective radius. Okay, just to show you the range of uh, X-ray morphologies, and this is um, Andy's f and Akash's first attempt at plotting the uh, LX versus LK, the popular uh, scaling relations. 
Uh, and our galaxies are th here. Uh, I just wanted to highlight that the stars are the central galaxies, I said. But we also have satellite galaxies, which are not the central dominant galaxy. Those are in circles. Uh, I want to just show that for each pair, you see a filled and open symbol. Open symbol uh, includes only the LX within one effective radius, within that circle I showed earlier. The filled one is, I guess, all there is. Okay, so there's some, obviously, uh, some difference. And I just want to show, uh, I know the locals here, and I would love to talk to you more about that. Um, and Kim and Fabiano had a very nice paper analyzing Alice 3D sample, right, the, the lower mass sample. And they are finding this, I think this is your overall scaling of power law of three, the steep, uh, but they did find that for the core, okay, the galaxies with the central core that I spoke about, uh, much tighter correlation and they are steeper. The coreless ones are flat, have a flatter LX to uh, LK. And I also want to highlight Yun Yun Su's work. I think you found slightly flatter slope. Okay, but our data points really add to this highest mass range here. Um, and I'll love to talk to you more about it. And we are preparing LX versus T, and we are trying to sort out core versus uh, coreless subsamples. Okay, so I just want to summarize here that uh, the massive survey is in progress. Okay, again, it's a volume limited mass se selected sample, very simple. Okay, where we can study various properties of the stellar, the dark matter distributions, stellar age, metallicity, gradients, okay, out to the outskirts of these 100 galaxies, and they're not completely dead, okay, and um, I'll report some of the black hole results tomorrow. And again, I'm pretty excited about these being actually possibly uh, binaries, or we can constrain the uh, binary ratio of the black holes using the pulsar timing arrays, if anyone is interested in talking about that. Okay, thank you. Right, so uh, we haven't done a statistical analysis of that, but by eye, I don't quite see it. So I think you would say the stars probably would be the BCGs for you, and the circles, right, would be the, the other sample. Um, I mean, we could fit them separately, yeah. Uh, yeah, right. Um, but that, that effect should be more visible if you plot it at temperature. Yes, we, uh, we have that. Plot, I can show you privately. We even have your bubbles on it. It's sort of, sort of uh, on some of your bubbles. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a, that's a really good question that we're trying to answer. Again, it's actually not so easy to answer because um, some of these are, haven't had deep photo, uh, spectro, spectroscopy done on them. So NGC 16, which I'll highlight tomorrow, which we think has a, probably a record-breaking black hole, um, it's, it's a brightest group galaxy but its neighbor is three, a factor of at least three fainter. So it's almost like a fossil group, although the x-rays are a little low on the low, low end. So I think we have some fossil group-like galaxies here. Again, those 26 I mentioned, they just don't have neighbors brighter than about L star. I would love to follow up on these galaxies to see how, you know, the, the fainter, how faint the satellites are. But sir, this definitely looks like each of the galaxies sits in quite diverse environments. Okay, thank you.